Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Linda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio show. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and the title of my message today is Returning Evil for Good. It's based on Proverbs 17.13. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. We all know people who have returned evil to us for good we did to them. I want to talk to you today about how the Lord repays someone who does that, someone who returns evil for good. Uriah the Hittite was one of King David's mighty men. He was an honorable man, so honorable, in fact, that when the other soldiers could not be home lying with their wives, he refused to go lie with his, even though the king bid him do so. Now, we know this story, and we know the reason King David wanted Uriah the Hittite to go home and lie with Bathsheba was because he himself, King David, had gotten her with child in Uriah's absence. King David was a wonderful king, the most highly anointed king up to Jesus spoken of in the Bible. But he had a weakness for beautiful women, and he especially had a weakness for Bathsheba when he saw her because he got into idolatry over her. He wanted her so much, he was willing to break the commandments of God to have her, and he did. Wikipedia states, the Talmud states two opinions as to who Uriah was. Number one, he was a convert to Judaism. Uh, Or number two, he lived amongst Hittites and so is known as a Hittite despite his being born Jewish. Either way, he was not actually part of the Hittite nation since he would have been forbidden to marry Bathsheba had he been a Gentile. I found this online in my research about David's mighties, um, this, the following, as the mighty men were called, of which Uriah was one. David's mighty men were a group of his best 37 fighters, later expanded to around 80. Although the list of his mighty men are given after David has become king, many of them may have been the loyal followers who stayed with him when he was fleeing King Saul. At the very least, they fought with him. Uriah's closeness to David is illustrated by how closely he lived to the palace and his position as one of the mighty men at the front battle lines allowed David to formulate and carry out his plot. So Uriah was one of the top men of valor in David's army. I always found it incredibly sad that Uriah was so very devoted to his king that he would have done anything for King David. And he was such an honorable man. He only ever did good to King David. Second Samuel eleven eight and 9 says, And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house. And there followed him a mess of meat from the king, which was like a gift. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. Verse 11, And Uriah said unto David, The ark in Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open field. Shall I then go into my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. Verse 13, And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. So David tried repeatedly to get Uriah to go and sleep with Bathsheba, so, you know, he would cover up his sin. Wikipedia says it was common for warriors in preparation for battle to abstain from sex as a practice of discipline. One of the other things that I find so incredibly sad about this story is that poor, loyal Uriah actually delivered his own death warrant, never suspecting a thing. Verses 14 and 15. After David tried everything and he couldn't, he couldn't get anything to work. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab, and Joab was over the army, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. 
That was Uriah's death warrant. And Uriah himself carried that to Joab, never knowing what was inside. So King David, I don't think out of malice in his case, but because he was trying so desperately to hide his sin with Bathsheba, had Uriah the Hittite killed with the sword of the enemy, the Ammonites. And of course, we think we would never do that. You would never do that, would you? Or would we? The swords of others are not the only weapons we assassinate others with. We use the tongues of others to ruin their reputations whenever we gossip. We use the power of others to hire and fire whenever we talk negatively about someone's work ethic or attendance on the job. We use their social power to accept or reject someone anytime we influence someone about another's character. We use many weapons to return evil for good, but we shouldn't. The penalty for returning evil for good is very high. It may feel good in that moment to smear their name or to cast them away from you in some other way, but the price is exorbitant. Let's look at the price King David paid, and let's remember, too, that he was the most highly favored king in the Bible until Jesus. This is another reminder, y'all, that the rules are the same for everybody. 2 Samuel 12. And the Lord sent Nathan, Nathan was the prophet at the, that time, unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. And now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also has put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Let me stop here for a second and tell y'all something I've taught on this before. David was forgiven and God spared his life, but the consequences of his sin remained. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted, and went in, and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose, and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But David saw that his servants whispered. David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. So the first thing King David lost, something precious he could never get back, 
was the son born to him in Bathsheba. King David lost the peace from his home and palace. When the sword comes to live at your house, there is no peace, is there? He suffered the successive violent deaths of at least two of his sons after that, Amnon and Absalom, not to mention the rape of one of his daughters, Tamar. So Tamar's future was taken and two of his sons were killed. Three precious things he could never get back after the baby, so that makes at least four major losses. All irreplaceable. This is a revelation that is fairly new to me. Something that the Lord revealed to me uh, after I got divorced from Jerry last year. He taught me that anytime you get into idolatry like this, where you choose a person over obeying the commandments, true, I call that true idolatry, or maybe it's classic idolatry, but it will cost you something that is precious to you that you can never replace. That's what it cost King David. David was an honorable man. He was an honorable king in almost every respect. He refused to kill King Saul, who chased him for no reason but jealousy for years because he felt that would be sinning against God. He would not compromise what he believed was right. But he fell so hard for Bathsheba that he was willing to compromise for her and sin against God. That is the very definition of idolatry. Our sin is unfaithfulness to God, and it hurts him. And there is a price to pay when we transgress the commands he has given us. And if we get into idolatry like this, we will always lose something that is very precious that we can never get back. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. A friend of mine whose entire life is devoted to God, who intercedes for lost souls and others for hours and hours every single day, told me a story about seeing Proverbs 17.13 in action. Recently, he got a phone call from a former co-worker. A situation happened when they worked together for a large, well-known corporation. An incident had happened on the floor uh, where my friend was a supervisor then. There were two people in the company who wanted him to lie and blame the incident on a particular person who worked there. I guess they wanted to get rid of that person or something. I'm not sure. And And my friend, being a devout Christian, refused to lie and do this. So they demoted him, which basically forced him into retirement. So his friend calls this last week and in the course of conversation casually mentions that both of these two individuals who tried to force him to lie have since had strokes and then they were both forced to take retirement because of the strokes. That would, it would be really hard for anyone to convince me that was coincidental. There's no way it can be coincidence that those two exact people out of the thousands of people that worked at this corporation. Anyway, he did not, my friend did not take any pleasure in all in that outcome. He would much rather have seen them repent and get saved. But y'all, we serve a just God who is extremely protective over his children. And like when you're in the woods and you threaten a mama bear's cubs, it's going to bring some real bad consequences to your doorstep. Rick, who is the uh, kind of the senior commenter in my comments forums uh, on the Just Praise Him site, posted these stories last month on the word called The Battle Has Shifted, and he was kind enough, which is characteristic of Rick, to find them so I could share them with you today. Here's his story. Recently, my old bookkeeper came over to my office in an apparent scam to get a quick hundred dollars from me without intent to follow through with completing the books. She said she finished the books and handed them to me. Loose papers all over the place, trying to collect the full price. I gave them back to her, reminding her they needed to be inserted in nice, neat presentation covers just like last year, and also there were mistakes that needed to be corrected. She agreed, but still needed a $100 deposit because she needed gas and had to go buy the covers I expected, and she was broke. So I handed her a check for $100, and she disappeared. Months later, after hiring another bookkeeper, my old bookkeeper called me up wanting her job back with a terrible story of what happened to her. She said she was in the hospital all of this time with a flesh-eating disease that they could find no cure for. She said she almost died. Keep in mind, this is Judgment Day. And then he tells another story. And this one was, this, this one really shocked me. I've told it once before in this show, but it's too good not to tell again. 
Next, I recently made a trade deal with my woodcutter to trade a very nice, light new rifle with a carry case and ammo box full of ammo. We agreed to trade straight across for two cords of wood, and I gave him the rifle and showed him all the parts, pieces, and purchase receipts ahead of time so he could inspect the items before agreeing to the deal. After personally handling all the merchandise and looking closely at everything I offered him, he, he then said, sure, he'd make that trade. And he said, you know, I'd like to have that gun. So we agreed and went our separate ways. Now, Rick, y'all, for those of you who don't know him, lives in Alaska. After the, all the wood was delivered, I gave him his new gun package and he left. A few days later, he called me back complaining that the pawn shop value of the gun I traded him was not the same as the value of the wood he delivered and said that I stiffed him. He said, I could hardly believe my ears. I didn't claim any value amount about the items, asking only if he had agreed to the trade. His choice was either yes or no. And to claim that I stiffed him was an unfounded accusation. He said, I took it to the Lord and asked for mercy over the situation, telling the Lord I didn't mean him any harm whatsoever, but I'd like to go the extra mile with him and give him a gift or something to put a smile on his face. Let me just stop there for just a second. Y'all, this is just extraordinary. This Rick is a true man of God, and that's why his heart is where it was. And he said, you know, I want to give him something else and make him smile because he feels like he got a bad deal. I asked the Lord to please orchestrate a follow-up meeting between us so I could do something nice for him. So today, the man just called me back and said that his house just burned down with all that he owned, including his wood business, truck, saws, and guns. He said he's living in his car now. That's some pretty serious consequence there, y'all. He said, so I asked him what he needs to help him out, and he said he sure could use a sleeping bag. That's, y'all, I have a lot of fear of God. When I read this story, when Rick posted it in the comments, it made me afraid, and I'm already afraid of God, okay? It put the fear of God into me. This man's house and everything he owned burned down. He didn't even have a sleeping bag to sleep in. And that's Alaska. It's cold up. It's worse, colder up there than it is where I'm at. And another story, because I know some of y'all love stories, and I do too. Over a decade ago, this is my personal story, well over a decade ago, I was engaged to a man and planning my wedding. One day, out of the blue, he told me he just didn't think we should get married. I was completely in shock, as you can just imagine. So I ended the relationship. And he turned out to be a liar, and I'm pretty sure a cheater as well, judging by what happened shortly afterwards. I had been completely devoted to him and treated him really, really well. He treated me less than wonderful when I broke off the relationship after he said he didn't think that we should be together, but I didn't see any reason to stick around after he said that. I don't know about y'all. I'm not one to hang around where I'm not wanted. And he made it abundantly clear he didn't want me, so I ended it. But you know how it goes. You see a person's true colors when a relationship is ending and they no longer have anything to gain from you. To this day, I thank God I didn't marry him. But when the relationship ended, I was going to sleep one night and I was praying for him because he had told me that day that he had gotten some real bad news. Bad news to the tune of a letter from the IRS that he owed over $18,000 for a prior year when he had not paid any taxes. I really felt for him on that because I, you know, uh, the IRS is just not fun to deal with on stuff like that. But especially when you don't have the money to pay him. So I was just, you know, I... Even if he did break my heart, I cared about him. And so I'm laying there and I'm just praying, you know, and asking God to help him. And all of a sudden, the Lord spoke clear as a bell to me. And he said, do not pray against my judgments. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. I didn't know that's what it was. I'm sorry. I said, I won't. And I didn't. I didn't again after that. I stopped praying for him. After that, not very long after that, in less than a year, he was, he was a mechanic. He was working on a car, and the gas tank he was working on blew up on him, and he was burned on his arms and some of his face, and then it burned down the place where he worked, and the guy that he worked for had no insurance. Within a year, he married some other woman, and she divorced him six weeks later. So, these are just the things I know about. I know God well enough to know that there was more. The Lord just does not take it well when you mistreat one of his children that has only done good to you. I'm just saying. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. So we can see just from the few stories we've heard that re to return evil for good is a really bad idea. 
And I want to mention something here. Returning evil for good does not just mean some friend you think has done you wrong or somebody you're dating or something like that. Returning evil for good will have the same effect if the person you do it to is your spouse, your parent, your child, your coworker, your friend, somebody you don't even know, somebody you just talked to at the customer service call center, anybody. It does not matter who it is. The rules are the same no matter who it is. The word says, whoso returneth evil for good. It doesn't say to this person, but not that person. It says, whoever returns evil for good, evil will not depart from his house. Period. That's it. Sometimes we return evil for good thinking someone has slighted us or done something they really have not done. Satan can work in people's minds and make them think things that aren't true, can't he? He will try to make you think somebody has wronged you so you will strike out at them because he hates them. Maybe they just gave their testimony or something. You don't know. So let's talk for a minute about how we are supposed to act when we think we've been done wrong. And the Lord tells us everything we need to know in his word, y'all, how to act and how to react. It's all in there, and it's all in there to protect you. The commandments are not just made-up ideas. They are your protection if you will follow them. Reading from Romans chapter 12. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. In other words, treat everybody the same. Be not wise in your own conceits. You know, That part right there can really help us a lot. Be not wise in your own conceits. Don't think you know everything. Don't give in to those prideful thoughts and you'll avoid a whole lot of trouble just by doing that, okay? Okay, let's keep going because Romans chapter 12 has a lot to say about this subject. That first verse was verse 16. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. In other words... Do what's right, being mindful that people are watching you for the Christian response. They are watching you to see if you will do the right thing. If you really believe what you say you believe, because they want to know if you are real, if you are honest, and if you are truthful or not. Show them the right response and you honor God. Show them the wrong one and you just honored Satan. Verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. This means if you can, work it out and live at peace with everybody. There are times when you cannot do that. There are some people that will not work anything out. But it should not be every time. If every time you cannot work anything out, you need to look at the common denominator staring back at you in your mirror. Okay? And figure out why you're always fighting with people. Verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Give place means leave room for God to do what is his and only his right to do. And that is to repay evil. We are not without sin, so we have no right to judge and repay evil. Only he does. And also, we don't have all the information. We may think we know what's in that person's heart, but we don't know. He knows. Okay? If you enjoy repaying evil, get into spiritual warfare. You can beat up demons every day and still be doing what's right, all right? Verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Have you ever fed your enemy and watched his response? It is an incredible thing to see. And sometimes it breaks the evil spirit operating in them. It won't break a Jezebel because she has no feelings. But it will break through a wall of hurt and pride if that's what's causing them to act ugly towards you. Verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We don't know what's in a person's soul when they do evil to us. But the Lord wants us to give a righteous response and let him, the only truly righteous judge, decide how they should be repaid. He knows why they did what they did to you, and he knows what kind of payback they really deserve, better or worse than what you're thinking. And y'all, he is so much better at this than we are. And he is repaying evil faster than ever now because of the lateness of the hour. 
We all know people who just thrive on revenge. They are angry, prideful people who just love to show the power they can wield to pay you back. Even if you didn't do what they think you did. I have an ongoing situation in my life from over a decade ago like this. A Jezebel spirit that just refuses truth, refuses salvation, and is very intent on my destruction. God has protected me, and that is the only reason I am still here and able to speak to you today. And I praise him for that, because many attempts have been made. I moved to Arkansas because the Lord sent me the message, Flee to the mountains, you are in danger. So I prayed several times in the presence of the Lord for where I was supposed to go, and every single time the leading was to where I am. I actually prayed over a map of the United States when I was trying to find out from God where I was supposed to go. Every single time. He showed me the same place in the map. I'm like, okay, I'm going there. I don't know why, but I'm going. The urgency was very, very strong as I packed as fast as I possibly could and did everything possible to find a house up here to rent. The one I rented is far too small and has many issues. An oven that doesn't work, a refrigerator that fills up with swamp water every week, a fireplace with a flu that no longer opens properly. It is old, it's cramped, and it's very poorly maintained. But it did allow me to get moved as fast as I could. And good thing I did, too, because I just found out this week that this person was just about to come after me again. So when I'm talking to you about not paying someone back who hurts you, please understand that I live every day with holding back from taking revenge. I am not just preaching this out of a book. I live this. This person wants to and is trying to destroy me. I have had the chance to land a devastating blow, too. And I am talking about serious devastation. And I would have been completely in the right making that move and would have done nothing wrong if I had done it. I I would have not had to do anything wrong, break law, nothing. I could have shut them down for at least 10 years had I done it. But the Lord is more important to me than feeling like I paid somebody back. Even returning evil for evil is wrong for a Christian. We are supposed to return good for evil. And so overcome evil with good. When we return evil for evil, we perpetuate the evil and we help the devil's work on the earth. That's not what we're supposed to be doing, no matter how much somebody hurt us, y'all. No matter how miserable they made us. And this can be very difficult because it requires you to control your flesh in favor of a more godly response. This is what it means to crucify your flesh. You refuse to let it have what it wants, and you make it to submit to what God wants instead. We are not supposed to return evil for good or or evil for evil. We are supposed to be doing good in the earth, not evil. So in talking about returning evil for good, let's remember that if we gleefully open up the gates of destruction on someone who has done only good to us, even if we think... They have done something bad to us, and this is why we need to let God repay, too. We are also opening the gates of destruction on our own lives, and it affects not just us, but our children as well. Remember what happened in King David. He lost the baby with Bathsheba, which also affected his wife that he loved, Bathsheba, because she grieved over that baby. And then he lost two of his sons, and his daughter Tamar's future was completely ruined. Those gates may bring the one you disdain sorrow, but they will bring you more sorrow, for your sorrow will be long-term when destruction comes to your house and refuses to leave. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. You are welcoming evil into your house to stay if you return evil for good. I don't think King David had any idea that day that he sent for Bathsheba, knowing that she was the wife of another man that he was throwing wide the gates of destruction and that it was going to reap such horrible consequences. He was a wise man. He would have never done that. He was just a a man who had a weakness for beautiful women. He had stayed behind and was laying around the palace, literally, when his army went to war in the time when kings went to battle. So he wasn't really where he was supposed to be, and that is always a chance for the devil to tempt us, isn't it? Well, we are not where we're supposed to be. We can get into big trouble. 
So we need to be very aware and be careful not to return evil for evil when someone wrongs us, no matter how much they hurt us. And we especially need to be careful not to return evil for good or return evil when we think someone has done us wrong. Because if they really haven't done us wrong, destruction is going to come show up at our doorstep. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Okay, I hope that 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 message was a help to you. I do have some prophetic words for some of y'all this week. Kelly in Oklahoma, your heart of obedience is very precious to the Lord. He says to tell you that you have a very big blessing coming your way. Taryn, You keep on going, even when the going gets tough. The Lord wants you to know that the going is going to get a little bit easier very soon, and he wants you to start praising him now for making your life easier. So praise him for that every day, Taryn. Thank you, Lord. I praise you for making my life easier. Kathy or Kat, I see an illness that is running in or is somehow connected to your blood vessels. Be careful of your health, Kathy. Be very watchful. Mark, you have always known you have a high calling, but you cannot answer it because the Lord says you are stiff-necked. You refuse to budge when he wants you to budge on something. The Lord says to tell you that you will stay right where you are until you correct this and become submissive and not prideful in your own knowledge. Dale or Dat. Your heart has left the relationship you are in. Your body is still there, but your heart is far from the woman you are with. The Lord says she is a godly woman, but you're bored with her. The Lord wants you to know if you step out on her that you will be caught and exposed, no matter how careful you are to conceal your cheating. He says if you want out of the relationship, then be a man about it and release her instead of cheating behind her back. Do what's right, Dad. Mike. You are a tough guy, as in a man that's, well, just tough. But the Lord says inside you there is a heart that is compassionate. The Lord says he is sending you into places others cannot go because they are not tough. The tough neighborhoods. The Lord wants you to go into the tough neighborhoods. He says you know where to go near you and witness to the kids and the teens there. You are called to mentor young men and teach them how to become strong, godly men. The Lord says you know what it's like, Mike, to grow up without everything you need, without a real father to guide you, and that you will be very good at this, and you will bring much glory to his great name with this work. This is a very high calling, Mike. Not a lot of men have the courage and the toughness that you have to walk in those places. There is one prayer the Lord says is more dear to your heart than any other. And he says if you will start doing this, he will answer your prayer and he will grant you your request. Go forth, Mike, and make a real difference. The Lord says don't let them grow up the way you had to grow up. That's all I have for y'all today. All glory to God for this message and for these prophetic words. As always, test the spirits, saints. No matter where you hear prophetic stuff, test the spirits always. Thank you for listening. I hope you all have a really great week. Jesus bless you. Next week's podcast, if the Lord doesn't change it, as he sometimes does, is going to be the Jezebel Exposé. We're going to be talking about some trademarks of the Jezebel spirit, how you can recognize her, and also tell you how to deal with a person who has the Jezebel spirit on them. And I'm going to give you a prayer written by a very, very anointed prayer warrior friend of mine that uh, was given to me against the Jezebel spirit. Y'all don't miss that. It's going to be real good. Bye now. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. You can contact me by mail at my new address, JPH Inc., Glenda Lomax, P.O. Box 60, Glencoe, Arkansas 72539. 
or by email at jphtoday at gmail.com. JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization, church, or denomination. Have you ever gone through a time in your life where all of a sudden it just felt like your whole life was falling apart? I call these experiences the wilderness experiences. Wilderness experiences are times of great uncertainty and change. They are times when our faith is tried and refined. After many of these wilderness experiences in my own life, the Lord spoke to me to write The Wilderness Companion, which is a virtual roadmap through the desert times of your life. Find out why you've been led into the wilderness. Find out what the biggest hindrance is to receiving your provision in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Drastically cut the time you spend in the wilderness by learning how to partner with the Lord instead of working against Him. Every Christian needs to read The Wilderness Companion. The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax is available on Amazon.com or wingsofprophecy.com in print, Kindle, and new audiobook versions. The Wilderness Companion. Don't go into the desert without it. Have you ever been betrayed by someone you love deeply? If you have, then you know being betrayed by someone you love can be a life-altering experience. What you may not know is that every Christian must pass the test of absolute betrayal at least once in their Christian walk if they want to go higher. No test hurts more or pulls more strongly on your emotions than when someone you love completely turns against you. Do you know how to pass this test? Through a revelation received from the Lord, I share the good news about why betrayal visits Christians and how to pass this test once and for all. Don't let your betrayal catch you by surprise. Get the Judas Test on Amazon.com in print and Kindle versions. The Judas Test.